you've had uh, exchanges with Piers Morgan. There have been many. I think he has been, uh, as I said to you before we came on, doing a kind of charm offensive for Israel, giving Israel kind of a soft landing for its brutal crimes by uh, playing a kind of a both sides orientation. And now I'm going to play a few videos, uh, very short, very brief. The first of which is one that you posted today on your Twitter account, formerly known or formerly known as Twitter, now X, where he gets into exchange with another with another journalist who's asking him, does he see the IDF as a terrorist group? And here was his answer. I want to commend you, Piers, honestly, because bringing me on for the second time, I have to commend you. And the fact that you actually condemned the settlements is very good. But people want to know, do you think the IDF is a terrorist organization? Uh, no. You don't think that they're terrorist don't, Okay, no. well, if you look at the UN definition of terrorist organization, they say killing civilians for political reasons. So you're asking my opinion. No, but if, I, if I the UN definition, the, according to the UN definition, is killing civilians for political objectives. Why are they not terrorist organizations? Well, it, well, you've asked me a straight question. I don't yes. think they are terrorists. So when you see babies like this, the ones it's who horrific. kill the ones who kill babies like this are not terrorists. It's horrific. So the people can who I, kill can babies I, like this are not terrorists. Well, let me let me respond. <laughs> yes. Let me respond. Right. I believe Israel has a right to defend itself. Okay. I agree that they need to get rid of Hamas. In this a, way, or a terror group. In this way. Well, here's the quandary for me morally, right? Why is, is it a quandary, though? I'll tell you why. With Hamas, it's not a quandary. I'll tell you why. Because in war, in war, when you declare war, as Britain did with the Nazis... 100 to 1 ratio. No, no. 100 to 1. There are, a, to there are ratio. a far higher number of children in Gaza, proportion to population, than almost anywhere in the P world. P so when P they P go P after give Hamas... Me a give me a chance. Very yeah, sadly... Very, very, Mohammed, let me finish. No, no, no. Very sadly... You have done... You are the one who insisted on equal time. I never did, but you will not respect the equal time. I'll come to you He's literally in 30 seconds. He's gonna ask you a in question. 30 seconds, I'll come to you. He's gonna come to you after. Let me finish, please. I am Calm in charge. Down. So, with uh, Piers was also Rabbi Smooley, as you could see, who people may know him for uh, outing RFK Jr.'s campaign as a Zionist project. But with that said, uh, Loki, first your reaction to that clip, and then we'll play yours because I think you had a good rebuttal on pure Piers about. about this exact problem that was outlined here, but I want to kick it to you. Well, as I will get into um, why this is and the nuts and bolts of why this is, ultimately Piers Morgan does not view all human life as equal. He uses very emotive language to describe the October 7th operation, um, of which much is not clear, of which Israel has spread much disinformation about, of which we have seen Israel implement uh, Han the Hannibal Directive, according to an Israeli Air Force officer, um, in which the Hannibal Directive, developed by Israel in its occupation of Lebanon in the 80s, entails Israel sometimes killing its own captives that are on that are taken by the Palestinian or Lebanese side in order to avoid them being taken as hostages. Um, <clears throat> for instance, recently Mark Regev admitted that the charred remains that were shown in cars um, were not actually Israelis killed by Palestinian fighters. They were Palestinians killed by the Israelis and probably Israelis too, though Israel again is lying about that. But um, Piers Morgan takes his talking points directly from the Israeli military and uses them to inform his coverage. And what Mohammed Hijab is doing with this section is he is pointing out that hypocrisy um, in quite a clear way. And and the subtle, I don't know if you caught, I'm sure you caught this, Loki, the subtle hint of Hamas equals Nazis, this historical uh, relationship that's constant connection that's constantly drawn sometimes in more crass ways by the most enthusiastic Zionists who, who constantly compare Hamas to uh, the Nazis <laughs> of the World War II era o or people like Piers Morgan who make this historical reference constantly to World War II as the West tends to like to do when there's a war that they need to justify they compare it to World War II because that's supposed to be the war for democracy. So um, we live in a time where talking about Hamas is uh, basic, essentially uh, really difficult because 
the weight of the information and misinformation is is totally stacked on the side of Hamas equals Nazis. I mean, I mean, what what's been your reaction to this? Because it 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 feels like it's been maybe the principal talking point on how to denigrate all people of Ga of Gaza, all Palestinians in Gaza, to dehumanize them because Hamas essentially. Yeah, essentially, it's a ruse. It's a subterfuge. It's a trope. It's a purposeful. Um, misrepresentation of Palestinian resistance to settler colonialism, which has gone on for around 100 years, over 100 years. You have to understand that numerous groups have popped up um, throughout this time, and the particular uh, bogeyman that they are focusing on today is just one of those many groups that have found a way to resist Israeli um, settler colonialism and uh, expulsion of Palestinians from their land. What I would like to say in terms of Pierce Morgan is he benefits from a very well-manufactured creative ambiguity, which is that of the, um, the eternal blank slate. So he constantly couches whatever he says in the um, in the terms of him not having a horse in this race, of him being neutral, of him not picking either side. I'm equally, you know, classic liberal moralism. I'm equally outraged by this as I am by this, which he just factually is not. But I've obviously investigated a lot of this stuff and I have more to add about how and why he views the situation in the way he does and what impedes him from seeing it in an objective manner, but also there is the genuine worry that he is coordinating his coverage of this with particular forces. You also have to think about the fact that he has only once, despite covering Gaza for an entire month, only once brought on somebody from Gaza who has lost family members. The majority of people he asked to come on the show are non-Palestinian, Arabs, or Middle Easterners. Now, that causes you to wonder if he is purposely talking to people like me, who, while they have a personal investment, which is um, many years of working on this issue, they do not have the same personal investment as somebody who's lost tens of members of their family. Were he to, uh, every time he brought on somebody such as myself or Mohammed Hijab, brought on somebody who'd lost tens, tens of members of their family, the effect on the viewer would be markedly different. Yeah, would, I mean, would he be able to talk like this in front of them and and get away with it? That is a, a huge question. Uh, because you know, in your appearance, and I'll just place, uh, you know, you your appearance on his program did go viral, so to speak. Um, because I mean, he it's easy for him, I think, to to touch to touch a nerve since. He is essentially doing this both sides ism. But I want to uh, just play a short clip that's been going around from you and, and get your reaction to your appearance and, and you know, how you view. Uh, I know that you said you have more to say about his function, so we can get more into that. So here we go. To Nelson Mandela, who served 20 for context, it was cut off a little bit. Uh, you were talking about how he was very comfortable comparing himself to Nelson Mandela. But let's continue seven years in jail for what they described as terrorism at the time, but yet you cannot see what the vast majority of human rights organizations in the world see when they look at the Palestinians. When you look at UN Resolution 194, paragraph 11, the Palestinians have the right to return home. Almost a, a million of them were displaced in 1948 with the foundation of the state of Israel. And what we are now on the brink of is Palestinians, millions of, millions of them, being driven into the Sinai desert with help of the US Delta Force, yeah, but low key, with low help key, let me of jump the British. In. This let me jump is in. a manufactured, making... an Israeli manufactured okay. humanitarian catastrophe in you Gaza. Making... There is a 23% infant mortality key, rate in something. Gaza. Let me say something. I completely agree with you about the plight of the Palestinian people. I've tweeted about this for the last two weeks. No, no, to be fair, you haven't, Piers, and this is not journalism. Shirin Abu well, Akhla was my journalism. Yasser Murtaja was journalism. 
Mu'taz uh, Azaza, that's journalism. Palestinians right. are reaching out from the cage that Israel has put them in, and they are trying to speak to the world. Yeah, and they are I'm being met, saying, they are being met with cold indifference. And I would say to you, Piers, I would say to yeah. you that that gentleman that you've just had on the show, Mark, mm -hmm. Regev, Mark Regev, he belongs in The Hague. David mm -hmm. Petraeus, you know, Piers, you made your reputation as opposing the invasion of Iraq. Well, yeah. I would ask you, journalist to journalist, how could you justify the interview you just gave to the head of U.S. forces in that illegal occupation of Iraq that David Petraeus led? He was then the head of the CIA. Both of the individuals that you have just had on this show deserve to be in The Hague, tried for war crimes. I am not anything like them. I have not hurt a fly. Those two men have. Why are they given the respectability that you gave them with your interview? And why am I interrogated as if I am somehow someone that could hurt a human being? So that that was I mean, that's been going around and I think I think it's very astute. It, it kind of exposes peers. But could you talk more about uh, more of, of what you had to say about his his particular function? Because I think Piers Morgan kind of has a. Uh, uh, a certain role that meant much of the Western mainstream media, especially in the United States, play as well. Well, firstly, let's start with the platform that he works on, which is Talk TV. Now, Talk TV was founded by Rupert Murdoch, himself a close friend of Ariel Sharon, also somebody who had funded through the News Corp Foundation an organization called the Jerusalem Foundation, which builds inside illegal Israeli settlements in Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, the uh, neighborhood of Al-Kurd family, for example. In addition to that, Rupert Murdoch was on the board of an oil and gas company called Genie Energy, at the same time that it had oil and gas deals in the Israeli-occupied Jolan Heights of Syria. So Rupert Murdoch is on top of that also somebody who had the uh, company LM, LLM Communications um, lobbying for him. And LLM Communications was a project of Jonathan Mendelssohn, who was the head of the Labour Friends of Israel at the same time. So ultimately, Rupert Murdoch shared a key lobbyist with Israel in Britain. Now, when we look at Piers Morgan himself, there is a personal relationship with the Mendelssohn family, which has not been seriously uh, interrogated and investigated. And I believe it leaves some clues about how he may be um, organizing this sophisticated engagement strategy with pro-Palestinian figures. So Piers Morgan has appeared several times raising funds for the Norwood charity. Now, the Norwood charity is a project of the Mendelssohn, um, uh, Jonathan Mendelssohn and Nicola Mendelssohn. Now, Jonathan Mendelssohn not only was the uh, head of uh, the Israel em Israeli embassy proxy, the Labour Friends of Israel, Jonathan Mendelssohn has also funded several pro-Israel organizations, but also he was someone that is a childhood friend of Mark Regev, the individual I just mentioned, and spokesman for the Israeli military. They were together in a summer camp and know each other very well. In addition to that, Nicola Mendelssohn, another close friend of Piers Morgan, is somebody that has spoken on Israeli government-supported conferences, but more importantly, has a very key role at Facebook where she led the procurement of the Israeli um, tech company that I mentioned that was founded by personnel of Israeli intelligence. Um, in addition to that, you have to remember that uh, Nicola Mendelssohn, under her watch, um, Meta, the company Meta and Facebook, has become full of personnel from Unit 8200. Um, and also... The, the charity Norwood that uh, Piers Morgan has uh, fronted campaigns for several times also has as one of its head figures Trevor Chin. Now, Trevor Chin is a key Israel lobbyist 
in this country. He is the president of one of Israel's four national institutions, the UJIA. He's also on the executive committee of Israel's largest lobby group in the UK, Bicom. And Chin is also known to have bankrolled the Labour Friends of Israel and funded Keir Starmer and funded Wes Streeting and funded David Lammy. So ultimately, this is the milieu that uh, uh, Piers Morgan is part of. But more important than all of this, he was pictured on the 22nd of October, right in the midst of his coverage of the war on Gaza, at a restaurant in New York, sitting next to Nicola Mendelssohn, this Israel lobbyist within Facebook, Nicola Mendelssohn, and also sitting next to the singer Catherine Jenkins. Now, Catherine Jenkins has raised funds for the JMF, JNF, which is Israel's largest settlement building body in occupied Palestine. So are we to believe that these uh, sharply pro-Israel individuals who are clearly close friends of Piers Morgan did not in any way seek to influence his coverage of events in Gaza. I think it would be deeply naive of us to believe that somebody can have close friends who actively lobby for the interests of Israel and not engage with this issue in a, in a bias in a biased way. And ultimately, we are seeing it play out with Piers Morgan clearly not showing the same level of empathy for what is, in terms of proportions, far more Palestinian human suffering than Israeli human suffering. It's clear that he ultimately does not view all lives to be equal. Right. I mean, it, just watching that that segment where he is being shown a picture of, of, of Palestinian babies being murdered and he immediately talks about a quandary where Israel is at war with a population that's majority children. I mean, that 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 kind of justification and doublespeak just I mean, it just exposes the fact that, well, was he saying this about the so-called uh, prisoners of wars, hostages that have been missing? Has he been making those kind of justifications, finding any way to explain away what's going on with them? Which, as we have seen, has been exposed over and over again as uh, uh, simply propaganda, all the torture and the murder. Over and over, we're, to we're told that this is happening to the Israeli um, prisoners of war, and then we find out something completely different. Yeah, I mean, also, what we have to remember is that Piers Morgan made his name as the editor of the Daily Mirror, right? Well, he became the Daily Mirror not long after it had been uh, sold off <coughs> by Robert Maxwell. But who exactly was Robert Maxwell? Well, Robert Maxwell was the owner of the Daily Mirror newspapers, but he was also an agent of Israeli intelligence. So I must be clear, Piers Morgan was not the editor of the Daily Mirror at the same time that this Israeli spy owned it, but it does imply to some extent that Israel may have had some type of presence in the Daily Mirror after Robert Maxwell selling the paper. Are we then to assume that Piers Morgan would not at any point have rubbed shoulders with any um, insinuations of Israeli intelligence. We've seen him pictured at a table on the 22nd of October, just two days um, before he interviewed me, if I remember correctly, with somebody who explicitly states that they have a lifelong relationship with Israel, who's married to somebody who lobbied for Israel in a proxy organization of the Israeli embassy. You know, and ultimately that's the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot more in all of this story and this attempt to control the narrative that uh, Israel has done. You know, we're seeing Sasha Baron Cohen, for example, um, going at TikTok now, privately lobbying TikTok for Israel. Now, let's remember that Sasha Baron Cohen in 2019 released a film called The Spy. He was the producer of it and starred in it. Who was the director? of this film, The Spy, based on Israeli spy Eli Cohen. 
the director of it was formerly in the Isra uh, a paratrooper in the Israeli military. And what was uh, written in the Washington Post? According to the Washington Post, this film, The Spy, on Netflix was a part of Israel's external intelligence agency, Mossad, uh, having a recruitment drive. So now this is somebody directly intervening on Israel's behalf within the cultural sphere. We're not outnumbered. We're just out-organized. That's the bottom line here, With to quote Malcolm X, with the story of the Palestinian struggle of staying power. And things are going to get more and more intense. We need to have a literacy about what the activities of Israel are outside of Palestine. Unfortunately, I think we have had generations of liberal misleadership, which has focused us on events within Palestine and, and, and given birth to a kind of paternalism, which is about saving the Palestinians. The Palestinians are fighting themselves. The Lebanese are fighting themselves. We need to fight ourselves. We cannot use their suffering as a reason for us to just stay here and allow ourselves to be pulled around by what the Israel lobby says. You know, unfortunately, it was one of the mainstays of the Corbyn movement was to turn the other cheek and continually get slapped, was to never point out that you were being engaged by Israel lobby groups, even when one of the key groups which militated against Corbyn relentlessly was the Board of Deputies. What did the Board of Deputies put in their trustees report just a year after killing Corbynism? They put the phrase, we have a close working relationship with the Israeli embassy and strengthen links with the um, uh, Israeli uh, the IDF spokesperson's uh, spokesman's unit and with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Now, why was that not seized upon? It was it was me that covered it and put it on Twitter. And after that, it's been covered by other people. But nobody in even the the generally accepted left media in Britain covered it. They acted as if it didn't exist. So we've actually had Israel lobby groups directly dictating what happened within the pro-Corbyn era of the Labour Party. It's a mark of shame. It's a mark of shame. And that's not going to be what this generation uh, is going to defer to in terms of leadership on Israel. We're not, we're not, we're not acting as if Britain is not a main um, center of activity for the Israelis. You know, agents of Israeli intelligence killed Najil Ali in this city, in London, Palestinian cartoonist. What happened next? Margaret Thatcher expelled the uh, Mossad base in this country because of that killing of Najil Ali. You don't have anything like that reflected inside the British political uh, elite and class. You would do quite the opposite. You are talking about people that have very close relationships with Israel lobby groups and or have facilitated the integration of British intelligence with Israeli intelligence. And that it's a mark of shame on us all. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.